Hey everybody, this is Pastor Schultz. I wanted to just take a moment to invite you to join me as we worship our crucified and risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, both at Pukwana Free Lutheran Church and St. Olaf Free Lutheran Church in rural South Dakota. Sunday morning worship starts at St. Olaf at 9 a.m. After the worship service at about 10.15 or 10.30, we get started with Children's Sunday School. At 11 a.m., we have worship service at Pukwana Free Lutheran Church in Pukwana, South Dakota. Hope you can join us, and I hope that this sermon on Matthew chapter 5 is a blessing to you this week. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled among underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till the heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till it is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Our sermon text this morning, we're picking up right where we left off in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus begins that sermon by giving statements of blessings to his disciples, to those who have heard the call of repentance and who have come to hear him speak. And there's also some who have come simply for the the miracles that he's performing, the healings that he's performing. But these statements of blessings, through these statements of blessings, Jesus has shown his disciples their identity is in him because the description of those who received the blessings matched those who were there, they were the, those who were poor in spirit, those who mourned. But not only did it match who they were, but it matches who Jesus is. That the description of, of the church militant that we said on the left side or in the first line is the same as that of Christ, one who is persecuted, one who is merciful. And so as we go through this idea of identity and that the the Beatitudes are communicating identity, I believe that this continues on in the rest, in our text today, that Jesus is continuing to express and to communicate the identity of his disciples in him. And so if you hear nothing else this morning, I want you to hear this and take this away, that your identity and your nature is found in Christ Jesus. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. And through the Holy Spirit, God has given you the faith which receives the forgiveness of sins, the righteousness of Christ, and eternal life. The identity of the disciples is built right into their name. To be a disciple is simply to follow after a teacher. And this was very common in Jesus' day and and after our Readings in 1 Corinthians, we, we kind of are going to hear about this some as we hear about those who say, well, I follow after Peter or after Apollos. They're saying that that's who they're a disciple of. But for Jesus' disciples, it's built right into their name. They follow Jesus. And because they follow Jesus, their identity is also found in Jesus. And that explains the statements of blessings that, that he has given to them, that they receive their blessings in him because they are in him and their identity is found in him. And so as we look at our text, and as we especially are going to focus on verses 13 through 17, we want to see that verse 17 is the most crucial verse for us to comprehend in our text. Jesus says to his disciples, Do not think that I came to destroy the law 
or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. There's two questions for us as we think about verse 17. One is, what does it mean that Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets? And then the second one is, what does this have to do with the disciples' identity in Christ? And by then extension for us today, what does that have to do with our identity in Christ? So the first question, what does it mean to fulfill that Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets? When Jesus says he's come not to destroy the law and the prophets, he's simply saying uh, in, in a way that he has not come to remove the law or to get rid of it. The, the word that's there literally is to destroy. And it's a, it's a good translation for us as we think about it as destroy. Jesus isn't coming to get rid of this. Jesus makes references to the entire Old Testament by calling it the law uh, or the prophets throughout his ministry. But I want to point out a few of them for you so we understand that he's not just talking about the first five books of the Bible, what often was called the Torah or the, the books of instruction and sometimes just simply the law. But he's talking about the entirety of the Old Testament. In John 10, 34 and in John 15, 25, while quoting from the book of Psalms, Jesus says, it is written in their law when he does so. When he's quoting from the Psalms, he calls it the law. Likewise, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. And there he says, in the law it is written, and then what follows is what Isaiah says. Isaiah, if you're not familiar, is the prophet in the middle of the Bible, one of the most important prophets, not considered part of the Torah in the sense of the first five books of the Bible. So the point here is that Jesus is saying he's not here to get rid of any part of the Old Testament. No part of the, and you have to think about this from from the perspective of the people who are hearing, that's the entire Bible. They don't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so forth. They have just the law and the prophets. And that was a way to be able to describe all of them. Later on, they'd make a distinction. It's called the law, the prophets, and the writings. But, but when he says law and prophets, or even when he says just the law, often he's referring to the whole Bible. In the same way that if you want to say somebody hasn't, you know, like, I like your car, you'd say nice wheels. You're not actually talking about their wheel. You're talking about the whole car, Right? So, so that's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, I haven't gotten, come to get rid of the whole thing. I've, I've come to fulfill everything. And so what does it then mean for Jesus to fulfill the law and the prophets? It might be helpful for us to think about this through the lens of law and gospel. And we've gone over that a few times recently, so I'm, I'm not going to dive into that real deeply. But, but the gospel idea here would be the, is that Jesus fulfills all the promises to bring salvation to God's people that God has made in the entirety of the Old Testament. There's promises throughout the Old Testament, so it's helpful for us to think about it not simply as the Old Testament tells us what we should do and the New Testament tells us what God has done. That's not how this works. Genesis 3.15, we see the first promise that God makes to mankind, to Adam and Eve. When he's, so context the fall has just happened, Adam, or Adam and Eve have just sinned, we'll say it that way. Now God is cursing both Adam and Eve and the serpent and the earth itself. And there in verse 15, to Eve, the Lord says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, sorry, it must be to Adam, between, no, this is to the serpent, that's right, between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And a beautiful thing that's in our Bibles here in the New King James Version is that seed and his, for his heel, are both capitalized. What that means is the the translators who are, are looking at the text, they're interpreting this, this is a reference to Jesus. Jesus is the seed. He is the heel that will be bruised. Genesis 12, a little bit later on in the same book, God makes promises to Abraham. He says to Abraham in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And then here's a big one. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
Later on, you have lots of history between there. You have the Exodus. You have the establishment of, of the king, kingdom of Israel after the time of the judges. But then here in 2 Samuel 7, you have another promise where God is telling David this. He says, And your house, O David, and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. There's, there's an, an eternity that God is talking about here. And obviously we know David dies. We know throughout history then the kingdom of the south falls and, and, and all of these things. And yet God's promise for the throne to be established forever is a promise that God makes that is ultimately fulfilled with Jesus. Later on, that, that prophet Isaiah is telling you about, Isaiah chapter 40 Verses 1 and 2. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. There's prom- the point of this is for us to see there's promises in the Old Testament and that Jesus is the one who fulfills all of these promises. He fulfills the promise to crush Satan, to bless the world, to reign as king, and to pardon iniquity. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets by being the Savior that God promised, being the Messiah, the Anointed One, who is God promised to send forth. But in order to be the Savior that God promised, Jesus had to fulfill the law and the prophets in a law sense as well. This is what we would call his active righteousness, that the things that Jesus had to do. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets by being the Savior of the world, but he also does so by obeying the law. And Hebrews 4.15 tells us a little bit about this. He says there, For we do not have a priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. This is Jesus' perfect track record. It's his perfect record. Righteousness, that Jesus takes on the entirety of the law and he keeps it perfectly. This is why Jesus' family followed the law at, by having him circumcised on the eighth day, by presenting him to the temple, by offering the sacrifices. This is why they were going to the Passover and accidentally left Jesus behind, all of these sorts of things. All of those things that are happening, it's because Jesus is taking on the entirety of the law and he's keeping it perfectly. So how does Jesus' fulfilling the law and the prophets, how does Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets? By fulfilling the promises to, to be a savior and by keeping the commandments perfectly. And so that, that kind of answers the first question of, of what does it mean to fulfill the law and the prophets? And the second question, though, is, well, well, what does this have to do with the disciples' identity? And ultimately, then, what does this have to do with your identity? 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Through faith in Jesus, Jesus' perfect track record, his, his perfect righteousness is yours. That's your identity. That's the identity of Jesus' disciples. You are the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. This is a righteousness which you could never obtain. It is a righteousness which is received. That is the difference between you and the righteousness of the Pharisees that Jesus says you must have that is greater than theirs later on in our text. The point being is that it's impossible for you to have more righteousness than the Pharisees on your own. We think of the Pharisees as the bad guys often in the Bible because Jesus goes toe-to-toe with them all the time. But to the people of the day, they looked up to the Pharisees and the scribes. They were, they were the ones who, if anybody was righteous, if anybody could earn righteousness, it was those guys. And Jesus says, their righteousness is nothing. Your righteousness must exceed theirs. Jesus says, they fall short. But the righteousness of Jesus, which is received by you through faith in him, your righteousness in Christ, it exceeds even that of the Pharisees and of the scribes because it is the perfect righteousness of Christ. And so, because of this, 
thinking of the Beatitudes, the kingdom of heaven is yours now. That means true comfort in times of mourning, the true inheritance of the saints, true righteousness and mercy, a pure heart and sonship in relation to God are yours now through faith in Christ. Anything that tries to focus your identity other than being right there is a lie. And we should ignore it. And we should return to the truth that Christ is our identity. You are the righteousness of God. It is with this in mind, coming through the Beatitudes and reflecting on verse 17, that Jesus calls his disciples to be salt and light. It's only with this starting place of understanding of who we are in Christ and his righteousness that we can talk about this idea of being salt and light. These are metaphors that Jesus is using to continue to communicate his disciples' identity in him. Jesus says in verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, he says, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So as we look at this first metaphor, we think of salt. Well, what is salt? Salt is a sodium chloride, right? If if you think something is salted, it either is or it isn't. There's no middle ground. Salt does not lose its saltiness. That's kind of the point. Jesus isn't here giving a science lesson where we should then ask, well, how can a salt lose its saltiness? He's using this as a metaphor. How the, the how the salt loses its saltiness doesn't matter in our text here. If salt is not salty, it's not salt. That's kind of the point. What is it good for then? Absolutely nothing other than dirt. It's no different than dirt. A salt that has no saltiness acts counter to its identity. It acts counter to what it really is. It'd be like talking about Dry ice, or hot ice, there you go, (laughs) because the dry ice is a real thing, right? It'd be like talking about hot ice or dry water. See, now you can see how I got confused there. This is an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. And so what sort of things do we use salt for? We use salt for seasoning food, for preserving food. It can be used to enhance fertilizer. If you read ancient histories, you find out that Ancient armies, when they would conquer a land, they would sow salt in the fields of their conquered land if they really hated those people. Like when Rome defeated Carthage, they sowed a ton of salt into the fields so that way the land would be completely barren. Salt has a lot of different uses. It was used as a commodity at times. It was often used as currency in the ancient world. But when Jesus uses it here, I think he's especially using it as that idea of seasoning and preserving When he uses salt as a metaphor for his disciples, he's talking about that that quality of salt that enhances, makes things better. But before we look at the meaning of that metaphor of the salt, we want to look at the second metaphor as well, because it kind of brings everything together for us. Verse 14 and 15, he goes on, he says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Light, simple thing for us to think about, right? Light reveals that which is hidden in the dark. Light is obviously quite beneficial to us. If we didn't have any light, I wouldn't be able to read. I wouldn't be able to see anything because it'd be pitch black, right? You'd be able to still hear, but, but we would bump into each other walking around. Light reveals, it illuminates our homes, it illuminates our roads and our towns. So you think of this imagery of light and the idea of the city on a hill, Jesus being close to the Sea of Galilee, it's only 13 miles wide, easy to be able to see that far at night if the city is lit up and it's elevated. And so the people could have looked across the Sea of Galilee and they think, oh yeah, just like how I can look across the way and I can see a city on the other side of the sea. When driving home from grandmas or grandpas or from a basketball game or whatever, and you're driving down I-90, you know, as you're going along and you're heading west, what do you see as you approach Kimball? From miles away, you see those truck stoplights, right? Or as you're coming up to Chamberlain, you see see the rotating beacon of the airport. 
light shows us the way home. It shows us the way we should go. Jesus says in in John 8, I am the light of the world. And he goes on, he says, He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of the world. But here in Matthew 5, Jesus is also saying, You all are the light of the world. It's plural. It's, It's for all of his disciples. So what's going on here? Well, Jesus answers this for us in verse 16. He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Romans 5 tells us that God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is the light of the world, and he let his light shine forth through sacrificial love. In a similar way, Christians are the light of the world, and our light, which is a reflection of the light of Christ, is to shine before the world through our sacrificial acts of love. These acts of love that God has commanded of his Christians is to be the salt with which which Christians season the world, specifically the people of the world. These acts of love that God has commanded of his Christians is the light of God which is being reflected towards the people of the world through them. We need to see here what is happening. Jesus is the light. Through faith in him, you too are the light of the world. Jesus showed forth his light through sacrificial love unto the cross. God uses you to shine forth his light to your neighbors. That means that when you show love to your neighbor, it's not just your love. It's the love of God. The way how Martin Luther talks about this is he says we wear the mask of God when we're loving those who are around us. Well, what does this then look like to wear the mask of God for our neighbors? To be the instruments of his love and his light. Well, it it depends, does it not? Sometimes it'll show itself in one way and sometimes in another. Let me explain. You love your spouse. You love your spouse by not only not committing adultery, but by leading a sexually pure and decent life in all that you say and do, by loving, honoring, and cherishing each other, by sharing everything that you have together, both body and soul. Parents, you love your children by acting honorably toward them. Parents love their children by rewarding them for when they do well and disciplining them when they do wrong. But, but parents, you and I, we're, we're not to go about this in a harsh way to cause our kids to have a rebellious spirit, but instead we're, we're to teach them and to model for them and to, to get down on the floor and to train them and to show them that which is right and that which is wrong. We're not only to correct with the rod because as soon as the rod is removed, and I'm using that metaphorically, and I think Luther in his day probably wasn't using it metaphorically, but, but when you remove the rod of discipline, then it's just, you just go back and do what they were doing before. The, the best discipline is going to be a discipline of love. The point is, I think, that, that we, we lead by example, we get down on the floor, we teach with a childlike spirit rather than out of a spirit of harshness. And children, children, you love your parents by not despising them or angering them, but by honoring them, serving, obeying, and loving them, cherishing them. This isn't just for you in childhood. This is for me in adulthood. This is for you in adulthood as well. But the salt and light is to extend beyond the household as well. Because it's not the light of the house although he uses the house as as an example, it's not just the salt of the house, it's the salt and the light of the world. We are to serve and to love one another in the church. We're to serve and to love our neighbors, our acquaintances, and as the Good Samaritan illustrates, for those who come across our path as well. We're to serve our neighbors by supporting them in their times of need, by helping them to improve and protect their possessions and their income to encourage them, and to be of service in them to their house and to their families. When Christians do not love their neighbors in a sacrificial way, as God has out, 
told us through his law, and as we see in the gospel of Christ, when we do not do these things, we are like salt that has no saltiness. We are acting counter to our identity of who we really are because we're acting counter to the identity that we have in Christ. When Christians who have received righteousness and which exceeds even that of the scribes and the Pharisees are the salt and light in their homes and in their congregations and in their neighborhoods and in their places of work, God's light is shown forth. His love is shown forth. And as a result, the Father in heaven is glorified, Jesus says. This is your identity in Christ. You are the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are the salt of the world, enhancing and seasoning the world through your sacrificial love. You are the light of the world, illuminating the love of God for the whole world to see through your good works, bringing glory to the Father in heaven. Amen.